don't forget throughout the evening, if you have any questions um, or reflections, comments, you can put them in the chat room and we'll have a few moments uh, as well at the end uh, to ask any questions. Um, I'm really happy tonight uh, to uh, welcome a dear friend of mine, Father Basil de Pinto. Um, it's been over well, 23 years since I uh, shared a residence with uh, Basil at Corpus Christi Parish in Piedmont. And I miss our morning breakfasts uh, where we could sit with our coffee and our toast and uh, just have a, you know, wonderful discussions to start the day every day. Um, Brother Basil has been in, in uh, retirement for a number of years. He's a uh, priest from the Diocese of Oakland. And I invited him and was so happy that he was willing to, um, you know, be here with us uh, to share some of the uh, wonderful journeys of his life um, and fascinating. Um, and one of the reasons is because of this book, which is a little autobiographical memoir entitled Wonder that uh, he wrote a few years ago. And the chapters are each named uh, with a city or a country, New York, Maryland, Kentucky, upstate, Rome, Elmira, Rhode Island, Boston, Berkeley, Moraga, Oakland, uh, all the places that have um, dotted uh, his life's journey. And I asked him if he would share some insights with that. To begin with a moment of reflection, I want to um, begin at the end of, uh, of Father Basil's epilogue, uh, one of the last things in the, the final pages of his book, Wonder. The most important doctrine I know in the faith I was brought up in is that of the incarnation. God truly became one of us and entered into our world, shared our human life. Jesus put his feet into the waters of the Jordan and thereby consecrated all the waters of the world, bathed the whole world in a laver of redemption and life. Like so many of our forebears, we have besmirched those waters, defiled the earth, and even now threaten to make it uninhabitable. But by coming into our world, God has expressed his hope that all would be well and all manner of thing would be well. We have to hope along with him. So we begin this evening with that uh, spirit of hope uh, that uh, Basil calls us to. Basil, if you unmute yourself, you'll see that little uh, in the upper corner of your square. That will say unmute. There you go. Is that okay? That's it. That's it. Perfect. Good. Well, again, Basil, uh, good evening and, th and thanks for being with us. Um, what about, uh, how about if you start with a little bit of um, your own background, uh, you know, where, where you were born and how you got uh, from East Coast uh, all the way across country to West Coast? Okay, do I start now? You do. Okay, uh, before I do anything else, John, just let me let's say to all the people who are watching, some years ago when I was more mobile than I am now, I used to come out to St. Perpetua and celebrate the Eucharist with your community on many Sundays. And I remember that and I always enjoyed it. And I remember the uh, wonderful, open and generous community of uh, St. Perpetua. So I'm glad to contact you again. Uh, just other one thing, I'm not very adept at these technological things. All of you frighten me, you look so great with all your microphones and your earmuffs and things, but uh, I'll do my best if I mess up, just uh, let me know, John, and help me out, okay? We can hear you loud and clear, you're doing just fine. Okay, um, you wanna know where I begin? Well, I, I was born, you know, first chapter of my book, I say, uh, I come from New York. Actually, I was born in Jersey City, which is across the river from New York City. And I say, if you were born in Jersey City, would you admit it? Most people would not. So I like to say I come from New York, but after all, uh, New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut are what it's called the tri-state area, the way Oakland and uh, San Francisco are called the Bay Area. So it's something very similar there. And uh, uh, full disclosure, I was born in 1930. 
uh, in the middle of the, uh, uh, almost the beginning of the depression. So I grew up uh, without a whole lot of uh, material goods, but uh, my family was uh, uh, really happy to make a, make a home. And there were four of us, uh, my mother, father, and my sister and I. My sister came along when I was 11. So I was a home only child for 11 years. And then when she came along, uh, it was really a perfect quartet. And uh, she was always the baby to me, even though she grew up, got married had children of her own, but I always remember her in that way. So that's how it all started. Now, where do you wanna go from there, John? Well, um, let's look at the, some of the spiritual journeys you've taken, Basil, because I've always found them fascinating. Um, you spent time as a, a Trappist monk. Mm -hmm. What was it that attracted you? And uh, you spent time at Gethsemane, which is the pristine place in our country because of the presence of Thomas Merton there. Mm -hmm. yeah. How did you, what attracted you to, uh, to the monastic tradition? Well, that's a complicated story, but the short version is this, that uh, I was in the generation of young men who after the Second World War uh, read the works of Thomas Merton actually, and was very much attracted by his description of what monastic life was all about. Uh, it was a kind of a romantic notion of monastic and contemplative life, uh, but it was a genuine one. And uh, it was the beginning of a long period in my early life when the monastic life was very attractive to me. But I'd have to say that uh, the monastic ideal was the foundation of whatever spirituality I've ever had, and I have it still. Now, I'm no longer a monk. I certainly don't live like a monk, but uh, the monastic ideal, uh, the idea of living for God, a life of prayer and work, was the foundation of uh, much of what I uh, still continue to feel as a Catholic Christian. The monastic life began really in the fourth century, right after the Christian church became the official church of the Roman Empire. Before that, the Christians were persecuted and then they became the favorite of the, the emperor. And at that point began a kind of situation in which the church was too connected to the political world. And a group of men and later women uh, went out to the deserts of Egypt and Syria to get away from all of the uh, complications of being the official religion of the empire. And they wanted to live a life that was separate from that, a life that concentrated on living for God and not for all of the attractions of the world. So that persisted, but also the idea that they were getting away from the official established church. They were Catholic Christians. Well, they were not Catholic at the time, they were just Christians. Catholicism came along later. They were Christians. They believed in, in the church and its teachings, but they wanted to live on their own and get away from the official establishment, so to speak. Well, there's an element, you might say, of revolution, if you want to put it that way, in the monastic life. And that, uh, that kind of stuck with me. And I think, uh, well, the John would tell you that uh, maybe it has remained. It certainly has, so that's the, but you know, in point of fact, in the last uh, couple of years, a lot of us wish we could have escaped to the desert to get away from some of the complications yeah, of life. But then, yes. when you yeah. were at Gethsemane in uh, Gethsemane Abbey in Kentucky, was that your first place of uh, where you were with the Trappists? Yes, that's that was. I went there in. Uh, uh, the fall of 1950, I had just turned 20 years of age, and uh, I went there, and there's a two-year novitiate, unlike most religious orders have only one, but it's a two-year novitiate, a trial period, and then you take uh, simple vows, as they're called, for three years, which means you can easily dispense. I went through those two years, and then uh, three more, so I was there for five years, and the last three actually two and a half, because after you are professed the first time, you remain in the novitiate, you don't uh, con congregate with the professed monks. So for two and a half years, I was there uh, under the tutelage of first the novice master, uh, and then 
of Thomas Merton, who at the time was called the master of, uh, of students. He was not yet the novice master, that came later. So I uh, began to uh, live under the tutelage of Thomas Merton. And that was a very interesting experience. Was he as uh, did you wanna... as popular at that time, or did did his writings? Uh, start oh yes, on? yeah. No, at that time, he had already published the Seven Story Mountain in 1948, two years before I got there. Uh -huh. So he, his book was a bestseller, made a lot of money for the monastery, of course, and uh, he, he continued to write. He was very well known, and uh, he was uh, uh, well known uh, in the world at large. And of course, in the monastery, uh, he was a priest and a monk and one of the community. But in a certain way, he, he couldn't help but stand out. You know, it was impossible for him to be completely uh, disconnected uh, because of his already his, his fame as a writer. You know, after uh, you left the Trappist, um, wh where'd you go to next uh, after that? Well, Excuse me, I was at the Trappist for five years and uh, it was a wonderful experience, but after five years of a, a very ascetic life, uh, I didn't need any meat for five years, believe it or not. The Trappist didn't eat any meat at all. So I had a purely vegetarian diet and that was very good for me. I think it has lasted into my old age. Uh, but uh, I, after, after five years, I began to feel, well, maybe I can continue my monastic life in something that is not quite as stringent as this. So during my time at Gethsemane, Father Damasus Winsen, a uh, Benedictine monk uh, from an upstate uh, monastery called Mount Savior, came and gave a retreat at Gethsemane. And uh, as a result of that retreat, I began to feel that I could continue my monastic life at Mount Savior in a slightly different and a slightly less austere kind of manner. So I did. I left in 1950, went to, to um, uh, Mount Savior. And I was there for just one year. I had a one year novitiate. And uh, it was pretty rough at the beginning. You know, I began to feel I had jumped out of the frying pan into the fire. Because it was a dairy farm, they made their living by a dairy farm. It did was they a, eat meat? Yes, they, they ate meat. Not too good. often. <laughs> once a week anyway uh, but there were other there were other things that made it more attractive however the difficult part of it was that one had to take part in the life of the, the monks did all the work for themselves when i was a trappist you know it was divided into the choir monks who were more or less uh, scholars and students and then there were lay brothers who did all the manual labor who did the cooking and the cleaning and they really waited on us Mount Savior didn't want to do that. They wanted to get back to more or less the original idea of St. Benedict was that all the monks were equal. There was no, no social division at all. So uh, one of the things that I had to do was first to do kitchen work, uh, not cooking, I've never been much of a cook, but peeling the potatoes and washing the dishes afterwards. That was not too pleasant. And then the other part of it was because we had a dairy farm, we ought to take part in doing some chores on the dairy. So when the monks, we got up at four o'clock, uh, the trappers used to get up at two weeks, we had two extra hours of sleep. We get up at four and you would go to choir and pray. But some of us, two of us at least, would go to the barn and begin milking the cows. And there were two milkers. The first milker who was the intelligent one. He ran the, he ran the machines and the other one, uh, clean the udders of the cows. That's what I did. I was the second milker. So, uh, the, the, the most, but I got through with it all right. You, know? you, were, you were the udder guy. I was the udder guy, exactly, yeah. So uh, I got through that for a long time. See, I got there in the July, I think. And by the next year, the, the, the next February, so it was about eight, seven, eight months, I went to the, to, to the prior, the head of the monastery, and said, you know, Father, I just don't think. I can do this. I can't. It's really too much for me. So he sat back and he sat back and he looked at me and he said, "Well, brother Basil, we were called brother, brother Basil. If you leave, how can I send you to Rome to study?" Well, at that moment, the scales <laughs> fell from my eyes and I was ready to do four weeks in the kitchen and the dairy. I said, "Okay, I'll hang in." 
So I did. And after a year, I made my profession as a monk of the monastery. And, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the ceremony involved the, uh, the uh, prior saying to the newly ordained, now, from this time forward, it will not be legal for you to leave the monastery. And the next day, I left to go to Rome. So the idea was, you do, whatever you do, you do under obedience. So they sent me to Rome uh, after a year in the bishop. And I spent the next four years at the college, it's called Sant'Anselmo on the Aventine in Rome. And I did all of my theology there for four years. And what year was that? Sorry? What years were that? was that? Uh, that was uh, 56 to 50, 1956 to 1950. So the first, uh, well, let me say, first of all, the studies were really wonderful. It was a time of uh, before the Second Vatican Council, but the ferment that led to the council was very much in the air, so that all of our studies uh, were very much in advance of what had been done in the past in theology. We had wonderful professors. We had wonderful opportunities uh, to look at a new idea of the church. So uh, I had uh, very good professors. I'll talk about that later. Uh, but I was there for four years, and they were there were four wonderful years, marvelous experience, both in the city of Rome and in the the uh, the, the travels I was able to make around Rome, uh, Europe. You know, I wanted to um, ask you move more towards that passion for art uh, yes. that uh, has been with you since you were a teenager, uh -huh. uh, because you've you've been. Um, uh, an art critic, uh, writing reviews and magazines and local newspapers and national magazines for opera, for film, uh, for theater. In fact, um, of the one time that I've never walked out of a play, but we, I recall the time we went to Berkeley Rep. Yes. And it was kind of an experimental uh, uh, play. And halfway through, you leaned over and said, I can't take it anymore. I'll see you later. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't remember what was the play. Do you remember? I don't, but I paid for my ticket, so I was not going to walk out, no matter how bad it was. So I, that. I wanted my money's worth. Whereas you, as a sophisticated critic, could say, "Enough's enough. I have to go now." Anyway, so you, as a teenager. I think one time you told me that kids in high school would sneak out of school to go to the opening of the opera at the at the Met. Well, what we what we did was uh, I myself personally I have to say this um, a lot of my friends were really serious sporting people they played baseball football all that stuff I was the kind of the the oddball I was a big reader I like enjoyed reading. I don't remember ever in my life when I couldn't read. I suppose there was a time, but I was a reader all my life. I enjoyed school and books and I enjoyed music and poetry and things like that. And I have to say my friends were wonderful. They always accepted me as a kind of the oddball in the group. Uh, they accepted me and they were very, very generous in that way. But my, I, I don't know how to account for it, but uh, from my earliest years, I was attracted specifically to music. And I can tell you how I remember. Oops, well, you're, uh, did you click your, you clicked yourself off. Yeah, you got me now, okay. I use my hands, I probably use my hands more so much. Uh, I was in my, I was in my grandmother's kitchen. I remember my grandmother's kitchen and she had a little cabinet about so high. And on the cabinet, there was a radio. And I don't know how it happened, but the radio was on and I heard a soprano singing an operatic aria. If any of you know this, Visidarte from Puccini's Tosca. I heard this music and something inside of me just went, wow, this is, this is something really incredibly wonderful and beautiful. And from that moment on, it grew, uh, you know, by degrees, little by little. But I remember that that was the exact moment when I began to feel that music would make such a big impact in my life. Um, so reading a great deal, uh, listening to music, even as a teenager, put me on that, that, uh, on that track. Now, 
uh, you're a little bit off. The, it wasn't that a bunch of us used to. I used to go to the opera by myself. Uh, every Friday after school, uh, I would uh, get a train in New. I went to school in South Orange, New Jersey, and that's above Newark. I would go down to take a bus down to Newark, get on a train, and go all the way over to New York City. Uh, get off at 33rd Street and walk up to 39th Street where the Metropolitan Opera House was in those days. Sadly, it was torn by, down by the villainous director, Rudolf Bing. We can leave that for another time. But I uh, used to go up there and get online outside. Uh, excuse me, we used, to, we used to say online. I guess we say inline nowadays, do we? In my day, we got online. It had nothing to do with computers. But you got stood, stood online about four o'clock in the afternoon. Stood in line for four hours till the performance began. And you buy a standing room ticket to stand for another three or four hours. So I developed very good, strong muscles in my legs. And they've carried me down to the present. So yes, I used to go to, to the opera after school. And uh, that was a really wonderful experience because, you know, the standees were a whole group of people who were, did the same thing as me. And we stood there and we had wonderful conversations and arguments. Part of the fun of being an opera lover is that you argue with your friends about singers and performances and so forth. And that was really very enjoyable. So that was kind of the beginning of that for me. And you carried that through um, your entire life. I mean, when you were, came to California uh, and became uh, incarnated as a diocesan priest into the Diocese of Oakland, uh, you, you were, were responsible for having an art column in the Catholic Voice. Yes. Uh -huh. Correct? Yeah, they, I forget how it started exactly. I think they asked me to, uh, to review movies. And I said, okay, I love movies, but could we go a little bit beyond that? Because there's lots of theater and music in the Bay Area. And so, yes, the, they consented to that. The editor agreed to that. And I began to, uh, to review various things happening in the, uh, in the Bay Area. And of course, I would always get two tickets. And you, John, came to, to some of those things with me, if you remember. Yep. We uh, used to do that together. And uh, I began to write for the Catholic Voice. And then uh, I began to write for other publications as well. I have a good friend still with us. He's, a, he's now in Southern California now. Franciscan preached Father Michael uh, Guinan. I don't know if any of you know him, but Michael was a great opera library like me. And Mike had been uh, writing articles for the Seattle Opera Company. And he suggested that I send them something, see if they'd like to, to, uh, to print something. And I did that. And I got to begin to write for Seattle. And then somebody in Washington, D.C. at the Washington Opera got hold of one of my articles and asked if I'd uh, write from Washington. So I did. And my editor there was a man named Mark Lyons. And Mark eventually left Washington and went to Los Angeles. And when he got to Los Angeles, he contacted me and asked if I would write for uh, the Los Angeles Opera. And I've been doing that for a good number of years. Every year I want, write one article. It's not a review, it's an analytical article about a particular opera. What is it about? What's the history of it? What should the performance be like and so forth? So those are some of my, uh, uh, some of my writing uh, and publishing. Is that how you came up with the- um, the uh, Love and music. Love That's and the other music one. essays yeah. on the human face of opera. Yeah. So are those section, uh, selections of- uh, yeah, those are all reprints of articles. Those are reprints of articles that I published in Seattle and in Washington and in Los Angeles. Yeah, so if you have those two books, Wonder and Love of Music, you have my opera omnia, all of my <laughs> my entire published outfit. And by the way, if I could say this to you, Wonder is now available on Amazon as a Kindle book at yeah. the outrage at the outrageous price of ninety nine cents. So if you want to invest 99 cents, you can get my book as a Kindle and you can also download it onto your computer if you want to. Well, I would recommend that, that folks do that because it's delightful uh, you know, to read, uh, you know, all the uh, mosaic, uh, you know, pieces of, uh, of a wonderful career and a wonderful life. You know, you worked um, when we were at uh, 
Corpus Christi together, you worked as chaplain at um, Highland Hospital. That's right. Yes. Now that had to be quite a different experience from both just ordinary parish work as well as mon monastic living. Uh, Highland is one of the most difficult uh, places because in Oakland with uh, at the time it was probably the crime capital of the country and a lot of violence and and struggle so what was the experience like at Highland Hospital? Um, I worked at a number of hospitals first at uh, Alta Bates uh, in Berkeley and uh, then um, um, I'm missing one but I wound up at Highland Hospital which is the uh, the county hospital you know, in uh, Alameda County. And I have to say that that was an incredible blessing for me. Yes, it's a difficult kind of work, but I found it to be a marvelous experience. Uh, first of all, as a learning experience, as a chaplain, I felt I was learning something every day from patients in the first place, from social workers, doctors, nurses. Uh, there's a learning experience about what's going on in the lives of these people when people are ill. You know, uh, it's kind of interesting if you read the Gospels, the first Gospel of Matthew, it's, uh, chapters 5 to 7, uh, the ser Sermon on the Mount, Jesus does his teaching. And to the beginning of chapter 8, when he comes down from the mountain, the first thing that Jesus does is to heal a sick man. And there are so many, many uh, incidents in the Gospels in which Jesus is healing people. He's both a te teacher and a healer. And those two vocations were part of my life as well. But the, the chaplaincy, the, the hospital ministry was a wonderful thing for me. I would be doing it still if I could, but I'm not physically able to do it anymore. Uh, when I was a chaplain, I had to wear a beeper. It could go off at two o'clock in the morning and I would hastily dress and run down to the hospital to anoint somebody. But uh, that was not a big part of it. The big part of it was every single day, I had a list of all of the Catholic patients, and those were my regular rounds. I would visit them, but I had many opportunities to visit other patients, uh, to have encounters with doctors and nurses, all of whom uh, had something to contribute to my understanding of how to deal with sick people. I also was also on the ethics committee of the hospital, in which we dealt with the uh, serious problems about, about patients and patients' life, including uh, end-of-life experiences, hospice work, and so forth. So it was an all-round wonderful, wonderful experience, and I've always been grateful for that. You know, the last two uh, town halls that we've had, uh, Basil, uh, get, because of the month of November and All Souls Day and All Saints Day, um, two weeks ago we spoke about uh, end-of-life issues and, you know, how we uh, in our uh, uh, Christian dispensation face uh, death, not mm -hmm. as a, a terminus point, but as an entry point into a uh, new life of Christ. But then last week we talked about um, the uh, specifically hospice and palliative care and those that difficult, some of the difficult decisions that a family or an individual has to make uh, regarding uh, whether to take certain treatments or to forego them um, because they would not be uh, extending the quality of life at all. I presume that was a big part too of your work uh, at, at Highland Hospital and on the ethics committee. Yes, it certainly was. And I spent uh, a fair amount of time in the intensive care unit and the emergency room as well. The emergency room at, uh, at Highland, uh, was at that time, and I believe it still is, uh, the center for uh, trauma patients in the East Bay. Uh, people who were shot or otherwise uh, near, near death, and they would go to the emergency room. And I was frequently there uh, in a consultation with, uh, with uh, uh, doctors and uh, with patients and the families of patients, just as you're speaking about, John, I had to do a great deal of work with the families of patients, helping them to make decisions about the end of life for their loved ones. And uh, that could be very challenging because sometimes uh, either patients themselves or their families would say, well, do everything, no matter what it, no matter what it costs, no matter uh, how, much, uh, it, how much it takes out of the patients themselves and trying to help them to make uh, 
decisions that were both reasonable and in the case of Catholics, faith uh, uh, informed as well, helping people to realize that as Catholic Christians, uh, as you said a little while ago, life is important, but life has a certain uh, time limit. Everything that lives has to die. And uh, death uh, is uh, on the model of our Lord himself. Uh, life is a death is an entrance into a new kind of life. So helping people to see that just keeping a body moving, so to speak, the, the, uh, the internal organs, sometimes when people are on machines, uh, sometimes they're even in terrible pain and uh, they are forced to continue with that. That's not something uh, that we recommend. It's not something that's necessary. And as a matter of fact, it's long, long been the teaching of the church that to use extraordinary means to keep a person alive is by no means required. Now, what extraordinary means uh, signifies has differed in the, and changed in the course of time. Uh, so what was extraordinary uh, 10 years ago may not be so, so extraordinary now. Nevertheless, people have to make informed and reasonable and faith-filled decisions. And that was a big part of my work. And I, as difficult as it was, I really loved it, really appreciated it. That, uh, that was our discussion last week, uh, reflecting on the, the teaching, uh, long-time teaching of the church that uh, we are not morally obligated to take extraordinary means uh, to preserve life because we know that uh, our God is a God of life and life is so precious to him that uh, there can only be more life even after yes. death. So, yes. And in connection with that, John, I just have to say, I, I would I always recommend to people that if they don't have what's called advanced directives, you should have that for yourself and for your loved ones. Make sure that everybody knows what you want to have done or not done. Do you want to be uh, on life support or not on life support? You write that down and let your doctor know about it and have somebody in your family or a close friend know about it as well so that you make the decision as far as possible. You make a decision about your own life. And if you can't do it, then somebody that you know and love will help you and will do it for you if you're not able to do it. One of the last things uh, we did at the end of the session last week is uh, there's a, even a movement called the Five Wishes. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but it's I'm not, no. it's specifically what you just described. It's the five uh, areas that you need to articulate for yourself, yes. um, so that at that when that time comes, and especially when that time comes where you're not able to articulate at that time your mm -hmm. desires, you will have already expressed those five wishes. So yes, that right. your loved ones, I always say it's a blessing for us to do that for Indeed. family yeah. and, and friends. Otherwise, uh, we really put a burden on them that, that they don't deserve. And that's our responsibility because it's our life. Um, tell me, um, you are a, a baseball uh, fanatic and a yes. tennis fanatic. Baseball and tennis are my two sports. So a passion for opera and a passion for baseball might seem a little incongruous to people. I know that um, uh, Father, um, our, the pastor that we were lived with, uh, Father Oliveira, Father Oliveira, Al oh. Oliveira, uh, you you used to drive him crazy because you screamed at the television throughout baseball games. And um, he who was not interested at all in baseball had a hard time understanding that. Yes. So I did too. So could you explain how you juggled those, your world of art and the world of baseball? Well, let's say about in both opera and in baseball, you have prima donnas, you know. <laughs> You have people who are completely wrapped up in themselves and they, uh, they express that. But that's just a, a, a superficial aspect of it. Uh, in both cases, you know, for somebody like, you use the word fanatic and I, I think that's exactly right. I'm never able to just sit back and let something happen in front of me. If I'm listening to music, you know, I've never understood the concept of background music. I mean, if there's music happening, I have to be involved in it. I can't have something just 
flowing past my ears. I'm deeply involved in what's going on. A friend of mine once said to me, recently a parishioner said to me, well, when you listen to the opera on Saturday, uh, it could make on for several hours. Now you're doing something else. I said, Mary, of course not. I'm involved every single moment, both with the text and then the music. I'm listening to it, I'm reacting to it. And the same thing is true in a sporting event. I mean, if somebody's up at that and we really need to have a run, for heaven's sake, put yourself into it and get it going. You know, get, get the, move that, that runner from first place to second. Uh, I'm not a big fan of uh, nothing but home runs. I like what they call small ball. You know, you move the baru, hit the ball, move the batter over, move the, the runner over. In other words, whether it's sports or music, uh, I have to be completely involved. Uh, I can't just be passive about it. Did you ever think that the the pitcher or the batter actually heard you at, through the television? <laughs> no, I'm sure that's not the case. No, yeah. I'm all by my screaming by myself, and I hope nobody else hears me. But maybe they do. <laughs> we all heard you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. So who were your uh, teens? I'm sorry? Who were your teens? Well, of course, living in the East Bay for many, many years, I was a, uh, an A's fan. And I still am to some extent. But I guess I'm a little on the fickle side because in 2010, when the Giants began to have those three seasons of World Series, 2010, 12, and 14, three World Series in five, five, five years, those were glorious years, they were wonderful. And now I kind of divide my, my uh, love between the A's and the Giants both. I mean, I, I, I can't necessarily decide, divide myself between them. I, I hang on to both of them. In the past, of course, I lived in Boston. I lived in the New England area for 11 years. And you lived in New England or in Boston, everybody's a Red Sox fan. So I was a Red Sox fan uh for many years and i still to some extent have uh sort of a soft spot in my heart for the for the red sox especially now that they're losing it's a little bit loving the chicago cubs the perennial losers you love them and you 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 root for the loot that's a big part of it and what about the yankees never uh you know i come from new york and i there are two teams the mets and the yankees i love the mets and i hate the yankees Want nothing to do with them. I love to see them lose. And now there may be Yankee fans out there. I don't know. I may have made some enemies, but that's me. Well, I'm surprised you use that word hatred, but I guess for a fanatic, um, you know, I can appreciate that and, and un understand it. Um, Is something on the screen from Gina D? Do I? So, uh, one reflection is uh, from one of our listeners is that you have wonderful energy about you. It sounds like you're fully engaged in whatever you do. Is this your secret to enjoying life and looking so young? Oh, wow. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll, I'll pass on the second part of it. But yes, uh, that energy comes from someplace I don't know. It is that, uh, uh, that capacity to really uh, enjoy and be involved in something, uh, not to be passive, uh, but really to uh, to express what I feel. That That is a big part of things, yes. Uh, Basil, you have a love of poetry uh, as I well. Am. Yes, and uh, you know, you, you, you did, when we were preparing for this, you asked me to about, there are a couple of people in my life that really were important. Well, I was going to frame that question this way. Uh, you have a dinner party. Who yeah. are the three people that you would most want to have at that dinner party with you? Okay. One's living and one is dead, but we'll bring him back from the dead anyway, okay? Uh, one of my theology teachers in Rome was Father Cyprian Vagagini. What, he was what was his name? Cyprian Vagagini. Vagagini. He was Italian, but he belonged to the monastery of San Andre in Bruges, Belgium. And um, he was a marvelous teacher. He was one of the greatest teachers I ever had. And the, the uh, story behind that is, you know, when I went to Rome in 1950, all of our classes were in Latin. So he, he spoke in Latin. Now I had been involved with Latin for many years. I had heard it, I had read it, but I had never known it to be a spoken language. Well, he spoke Latin the way you and I speak English. 
the first few weeks when I went to Rome, Rome, I got there in October, October 15th, school started, and I had all my classes in Latin. So I, I couldn't understand a word. And I thought, oh my God, I'm gonna flunk out, I'll have to go home. But about the 1st of December, something clicked in my brain and it all began to be clear. So I could understand what he was saying. So Father, Father Cyprian was a marvelous teacher and I had four years of his teaching and his wonderful clarity of his thought and the wonderful progressive way that he, he approached uh, doctrine of the church and the idea of the church he was one of the people who prepared me so well for the to welcome the second vatican council and if he were still alive i would certainly love to have him at my dinner table what were the classes that he taught specifically uh, were there were two two courses in dogma and he had dogma one dogma two was taught by the rector of the seminar of the, of the college father augustine meyer who later became a bishop, and I think even a cardinal, but I think he's dead now too. So I had those two dogma classes. Yeah. Now the other person that I would like to, to mention to you is uh, the great poet Robert Haas. Now Bob and I can call him Bob because we are we are friends. We were colleagues at St Mary's College. I taught at St Mary's College for. Uh, I was there for five years as the hospital as the uh, uh, campus minister. The campus pastor and four of those years i taught in the english department i taught freshman english and i always say i have had my purgatory uh, because those college freshmen couldn't do what most of us could do in the fifth grade it was really difficult <laughs> and, but during those four years one of the things that happened was Bob was on the faculty along with me in the English department. He was already a well-known poet, but he was teaching at St. Mary's. And he gathered a group of us who he thought might be interested one day. Uh, the famous Irish poet Seamus Heaney had just published a book called Station Island about a, a sanctuary and pilgrimage place in Ireland. And Bob talked to us about uh, that book, about Heaney's poetry. So as I said before, when I had that experience of listening to a piece of music for the first time, when Bob spoke to us about this poetry of Seamus Heaney, it was the exact same kind of experience that something popped inside of me. And I all of a sudden began to feel, wow, poetry has got to be a part of my life as well. You know, So both in the case of music and of poetry, there was a kind of road to Damascus experience. I was knocked off my horse. Well, there's no horse in the story. St. Paul didn't have a horse. But in pictures, though, it showed getting knocked off his horse. In any case, in both cases, I was really given a very strong experience that impelled me for the rest of uh, my life to, to love that particular art form. Bob and his wife, Brenda Hillman, who is also a poet, have become wonderful friends. Uh, I have socialized with them in the days when we could do that. At the moment, that's not really possible. But uh, he has also, also been very, very kind to me. We email one another. He's very, very busy. He's got an enormously busy schedule of writing and publishing and, and lecturing. But if I send him a brief email, he's always kind enough to, within a day or so, to answer my email. So he's not only a great poet, he's a wonderful human being. And I really revere this great man. And I'm so grateful for his friendship. So you get a third person at your dinner party. A third, let me think. I did have another teacher uh, when I, uh, I went to uh, Providence College in Providence, Rhode Island at one point in my life. Uh, I was living in Rhode Island, before I went to Boston, I was in Rhode Island in the diocese of uh, Providence. And I decided I needed a degree in English because uh, I was gonna be teaching it. So I went to Providence College, which is run by Dominican fathers. And I, my first course was in literary criticism, a kind of basic course in, in understanding literature. And my teacher was a Dominican friar named Father Tom Cotsgren. And he was another one of those really wonderful teachers, an incredibly instructive and impressive kind of man. And uh, he started with uh, uh, the poetics of Aristotle and came down to the 1930s and 40s, gave us a whole history of literary endeavor and writing. And again, he was just a wonderful teacher. And uh, I loved listening to him and talking to him, being able to, to 
discuss with him. And in all three of those cases, I would love to have them and be able to listen to them in the first place and then to talk to them and question them and listen to their answers. That's my idea of having a real, a real fun dinner party. Well, I'm surprised you don't have entertainment of a musical kind at that dinner party. And so who from the opera world uh, would be at your table? Either an opera singer, director, composer? Sure. Uh, I could mention a lot of singers, but um, she probably would not be very, uh, very uh, hospitable or very easy to talk to. But Maria Callas, the famous Greek American soprano who became the master of Italian opera, uh, is uh, one of the greatest singers I've ever known, I've ever heard. I have practically everything she ever recorded and a lot of so-called pirated recordings, uh, recordings that were made against the law and later uh, later published and released, but a lot of them again, later were legalized. Collins was a very great artist and I loved listening to her. Um, I would also think uh, about uh, a conductor like uh, uh, Wilhelm Furtwängler, who was a great German conductor uh, who led me to have a greater understanding of music through the way he, he led music. Today, there is a, still a conductor living named Simon, Sir Simon Rattle. He's an Englishman, but for many years, he was the conductor of the Berlin Philharmonic. And uh, one of the great uh, uh, things of uh, this whole uh, technological world is I have a subscription to the Berlin Philharmonic um, for which I pay just a few dollars a month. And I get it on my laptop and I can get, I can get hundreds of hundreds of uh, concerts of the Berlin Philharmonic, but there are also interviews with, uh, uh, with Simon. And he's a wonderful raconteur. He so, speaks beautifully about music. I would love to sit down and talk to Simon and have him tell me some of his ideas about music. How about those two? Uh, that, that's good, that'll do. Maria Callas would be, uh, would be wonderful. What was the uh, play, that stage play, uh, about her a few years ago? Oh, um, there was one that, the play that, that Berkeley rep uh, about her, remember? Uh, I, I don't remember the title of hand now. A uh, masterclass. Masterclass, that's it. And you know, they used that title because she did give masterclasses at the Juilliard School in New York after she retired. And those were recorded and I have the recordings of that masterclass which is really wonderful to her talking about opera and how she interpreted it, yeah. Uh, one of our uh, participants said thank you for bringing back wonderful memories of East Coast and Boston uh -huh. enthusiasm, the yeah. Red Sox and growing up in New England. Yeah. Also Alta Bates County Hospital experience in the Bay Area sure. and opera. <laughs> so you do have some fellow aficionados uh, since she mentioned New York, I, I, we haven't talked about theater, but I, I also went to a lot of theater in New York. I was a teenager, you know, between the ages of 14 and 20 and for six years, I went to a lot of things in New York. And I have some marvelous memories of great, great theater experiences. One of them was Judith Anderson as Medea and uh, Catherine Cornell uh, as Cleopatra in, in uh, Shakespeare's Antony and Cleopatra, uh, wonderful stuff. Also uh, in London, I was able to travel to London a number of times. And I once, I remember very well seeing Judy Dench in Chekhov's The Cherry Orchard. Uh -huh. That's a fantastic memory. And to prove it, you know, I have, I've saved all of my programs beginning about 1970. And I have them on hand and if you want, Proof that I was there, I can bring out the program and show it to you. <laughs> People may think I'm crazy, but there it is. Who would be the contemporary playwrights that, uh, you, know, that well, you enjoyed? Contemporary, I would have difficulty with, but more recently, uh, Arthur Miller, among Americans, certainly, Arthur Miller. Uh, Alan Bennett, uh, the Englishman, has done some wonderful stuff. Bennett wrote a wonderful play called The History Boys. Some of you may know that it was also made into a film with the same cast as those uh, 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 in the, uh, the theater, in the play. Uh, it's about a group of high school students getting ready to take uh, the entrance exams into Oxford and Cambridge. 
And it's the story of how their teachers and these boys work together to get them their scholarships to the Oxbridge universities. It's a beautiful, humane kind of uh, experience. It's a beautiful, uh, Bennett is a great, great playwright and a great writer. Uh, he writes a diary once a year in the London Review of Books, and it's always a pleasure to read. What's the title of that play? The History Boys. You can get it on Netflix as a movie. Just go to Netflix and get it uh, as a movie. Great. Well, in uh, in our lovely COVID country, we are watching Netflix a lot. That's so a great deal. We'll, yes. put that, yeah. we'll put that on our on our list. Um, you know, we share a, a lot of uh, theological leanings. And uh, part of uh, our shared uh, pastoral experience and theology is uh, some of the disappointment that we've experienced over the years after Vatican II, and the, yeah. uh, that you know that fire that was burning in 1965, and as the Vatican II unfolded, and then there seemed to be a reneging or. A, a fear almost that set in that kind of turned things around. Um, what are some of the, the hopes that you look for that are things that we need to recover or as we look to the future uh, as, as a church community? Well, one thing I think I would, that springs to mind right away, John, is the treatment of women in the church. You know, women really effectively have no, no no place to exercise any kind of authority. And um, there is really nothing, now I'm taking my chances here, and if you wanna, if anybody wants to disagree with me, go ahead, but uh, there's nothing that, that demands in uh, teaching of our faith that only men can be ordained priests. And I think that for women to be ministers of the gospel, the Eucharist, the pastoral sense, that they have, they could have, if they were able to, to exercise it, would be add a tremendous uh, dimension to, to our church. So I think that justice requires that somewhere in the future, there will be somebody as, as uh, brave as our present Holy Father, Father Francis, who would, uh, Pope Francis, who would not agree with me on this particular issue maybe, but uh, somebody uh, in the pipeline of authority to say that women must have a stronger place uh, uh, in the church. Allied to that is the whole idea of the celibate priesthood, which didn't exist in the church for a thousand years. And obviously somebody at my age is certainly not looking to get married. You know, I'm not talking about myself, but certainly uh, if priests were able to receive all of the sacraments, if women could receive all of the sacraments, including the sacrament of matrimony, uh, it would be, again, a question of justice towards the, uh, the Christian community, all the people, men and women, all of us, uh, sharing in the great riches of the sacramental and authority life of the church. You know, I've always maintained that um, it's half of the human race and I think both for church and society, until women have the same place at the table that men do, we're missing, missing out and we're not giving the full complement of what God has created the world and humanity uh, to be. Um, someone had just posted a, a comment that, Father Basil, I'd love to have you at my dinner party. Oh, thank you so much. That's really kind. <laughs> and um, I'm grateful because uh, I have had you at my breakfast table yes. and dinner table many times. And, yes, I, and I, I have enjoyed your wonderful cooking. <laughs> and I look forward to, uh, to that happening again very soon. And Basil, I just want to let you know that uh, someone that's on our um, uh, town hall this evening is Gail Clark. Who oh, when, is he? Uh, yes, he is. Gail is there. Gail is in San Francisco and uh, listening in. I told him that you would be on and he and his wife Louise and their new baby. Oh and, my. and they're looking forward to a time when uh, we can get together with them uh, very soon in, in Lafayette. So you can uh, meet his wife and his new baby. And if his mother, Maya, comes to visit, 
-hmm. we'll re reunite uh, from wonderful times we had. We would. We and Maya would make you the great uh, Turkish co or Egyptian coffee that you love. That's right, which will keep you up not all night. That's right. For two, for two days. Okay, but, yes. But well, um, our time is up, and I want to thank you, uh, you know, very much, uh, Basil. It's it's really delightful, and uh, you know, to get the insight and to see the, as I say, the rich, you know, tapestry um, of the of the many many directions that your life uh, has taken. I want to uh, just let our community know next week. Um, at our town hall gathering will be, uh, I've got to open it up. Ah, there it is. Um, our community for years has supported um, a number of organizations that are helping people in need. So we're gonna have representatives from Winter Nights Shelter and from Trinity Center uh, who will be with us uh, especially because we look to the colder months when people who are on the streets or living in their cars, you know, are looking for uh, warmer places. And also, um, I think November is uh, a month dedicated to um, uh, remembering the, the homeless uh, and their, their needs. So that there'll be representatives of Trinity Center and Winter Night Shelter will be with us next week. I, I want to close um with the what you closed your book wonder with uh basil it's a poem oh, yes. uh, and i i do love the fact that um you do love the uh, polish poets uh, oh yes uh -huh. Samborska, and the uh famous poet at cal berkeley uh again Miloš, just love Miloš. Miloš, another uh, you know, compatriot of yours. And this one, uh, you close your epilogue with uh, entitled The Ball. As long as nothing can be known for sure, no signals have been picked up yet, as long as Earth is still unlike the nearer and more distant planets, as long as there's neither hide nor hair of other grasses graced by other winds, of other treetops bearing other crowns, other animals as well grounded as our own, as long as the only the local echo has been known to speak in syllables, as long as we still haven't heard word of better or worse Mozarts, Plato's, Edison somewhere, as long as our inhuman crimes are still committed only between humans, as long as our kindness is still incomparable, peerless, even in its imperfection, as long as our heads packed with illusions still pass for the only heads so packed, as long as the roofs of our mouths alone still raise voices to high heavens, let's act like very special guests of honor at the district fireman's ball, dance to the beat of the local oompa band and pretend that it's the ball to end all balls. I can't speak for others. For me, this is misery and happiness though, enough. Just this sleepy backwater where even the stars have time to burn while winking at us unintentionally. And you close by saying, isn't that beautiful? Well, it's beautiful to have you with us, priest and poet and critic and friend. So thank you very much. And everyone, uh, have a peaceful evening, and we'll see you soon.